Okay, hello everybody to one of our seminars here in CFT. Today we have the pleasure of uh, having Adam Cabello from the Universidad de Sevilla. Uh, I'm sorry for my awful Spanish. So Adam uh, did his PhD in physics in the Universidad Complutense de Madrid in 1996. And right after that, he became, uh, he started to work in the Universidad de Sevilla. And since uh, 2009, he is a full professor there. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Adon, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about state independent certification of quantum observables and minimal bulk partite full non locality. And the takeout message of the whole talk is, is this uh, Koch and Specker sets are not just beautiful, but they are fundamental in quantum mechanics, and some of them have unique applications. The talk is based on three very recent uh, papers that are one with Juan Liu, Ho Jun Chung, Emmanuel Sambrini, Junior Gonzalez, and Javi Ramanathan. Then there's a follow up of that paper that will be very soon in the in the archive. And uh, the final part of the talk, if we have time, will be devoted to uh, work together with Sen Peng Su, Deva Saha, and Kishor Bharti. In the first part, I will focus on bipartite Bell scenarios. In particular, in symmetric ones, Alice has uh, uh, X settings with capital A outputs, Bob has Y settings with capital B outputs. And as usual, I will uh, use PABXY uh, in the usual way. X and Y are Alice and Bob measurements, respectively. A and B are Alice and Bob outcomes, respectively. Uh, pardon, the... pardon, pardon to interrupt. Pardon. Hi, yeah. hi, Adan. Hola. Hi. Que tal, Adan? Hola. Uh, Siarek. Uh, for some reason, we see only about one fourth of your slide. I'm not sure if this is the problem with me or the problem with uh, screen sharing. Uh, I think we are getting, uh, like, for me, it is okay. Uh, for you, it is okay because I see well, only for me here it's also okay. For you, it's okay. So this must be my problem. All right, thank you, and and sorry for interrupting. Maybe I you can go okay. out and then come again, like log out and come in. You can join again. Got it. Got it. Got it. Zoom. Yeah. Uh, Zoom applied some uh, different ratio. Problem solved. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Please go ahead. Okay. Good. I was saying in the first part of the talk, I will focus on uh, four different problems. Okay. And, and the first of them is uh, related to the geometry of the quantum sets of correlations. Okay, as you may know, if you, for instance, take the two, 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 two Bell scenario, namely the one in which Alice and Bob, each of them has two settings and each of the outcomes is two, and you find the, let's say, right cut, you will observe this relationship between the local set, which is a polytope, the quantum set, which is a convex set, outer side of the polytope, and inside the no signaling polytope, right? A important point, it can be proven that not just in quantum mechanics, but actually in any theory with ideal measurements, the uh, uh, non-local vertices of the no signaling polytope cannot be achieved. Okay, I insist this is not just about, about quantum mechanics, but about more general, about more general theories. And kind of the first question is, okay, knowing that, which is the, the uh, point of the quantum set, which might be closer to uh, no signaling, I mean, no local, no signaling uh, phase. Okay, for instance, in 2222, the maximum violation of a closed or horse symmetry hold is uh, this point here, which is very, very far away from the from the uh, non-signaling polytope. You 
cut, you find the right, uh, let's say, projection. For instance, this is a projection taken from, from this paper. You will notice that it, already in 2222, there are points that are touching a phase of the no signal in polytope, but it is a phase that also contains local points, right? And now the interesting move is that, well, this is well known and, and, and here we cannot do it. I mean, this is basically all the, the possibilities uh, of being in the boundary, in the non-local boundary. But if we move to uh, a Bell scenario with more inputs and more outputs, for instance, three, four, three, four, here you see that there is a quantum correlations that is touching a phase of the no signal in polytope that doesn't contain any local point. Okay, so problem number one is, which is the simplest bipartite quantum correlation that is in a phase of the no signal in polytope that doesn't contain local points. As far as I know, this is an open problem in the field. Okay, let's move on. Now, another perspective is given by the attempts to quantify non-locality. Okay. I would say that the uh, most common way to do that is through the local fraction. Okay, any uh, correlation can be written as a combination of a local correlation plus a no local, no signaling correlation. And there are infinitely many ways to do that. But if you consider them all and you uh, focus on the one in which the, the, you get the maximum, uh, let's say, uh, local content, this is called, this maximum is called the local fraction. Okay, this was introduced by Elit Sur, Popescu, and Rolich. Uh, if this is one, this is a local collation, but if this is zero, this is a fully local, it's called a fully local collation or an example of full non-locality. Using the previous example, 222, two, I mean, you can compute the local fraction of the maximum violation, quantum violation, of closer or simony hold, and then you get 0 0.586, or you can compute the local fraction of this point, which incidentally corresponds to the, let's say, optimal mm, version of the Hardy uh, argument of non-locality. Good. Uh, in any case, both values are far, far away from zero. Zero would be an example of uh, fully non-local. However, if we move to the 3434, three, four, we have a situation like this, okay? In which the local fraction of this correlation, the same as before, you compute it in, in exactly zero. So a second problem is, which is the simplest bipartite quantum correlation that has local fraction zero or that is fully non-local or strongly non-local, depending on, on the reference. Let's move to a third problem, which is related to Greenberger, Horn, and Seilinger, or all versus nothing non-locality. Greenberger, Horn, and Seilinger introduce a, a proof of Bell theorem, which is kind of special. As you know, there are three parties, each of them with uh, two possible settings, each of them with two possible outcomes. If you prepare the three qubits in a particular state and you measure a particular set of observables, you get uh, a particular example of non-locality. And what is special about this thing? Well, what is special in the, in the first reading is that you can visualize the, the conflict between local hidden variables and quantum mechanics, just writing down four conditions and just a simple algebraic argument tells you that it is impossible to obtain a deterministic hidden variable 
argument. Okay, very good. It is also known that uh, the same thing can be a, a kind of proof like this with the same, exactly the same uh, properties can be achieved with two parties. In this particular case, Alice has three settings that is convenient to label with, with a double index. Uh, Bob also has three settings, all of them with four outcomes that again is interesting to label them as each of them as two bits. Okay, then if you prepare this particular Q core, Q core state, and you choose this particular local measurements for Alice and Bob, you can uh, find that there are nine equations very much in the spirit of GZ in which uh, the outcome of, of, of a particular uh, measurement of Alice allows Alice to predict with certainty a similar outcome of a particular uh, measurement of Bob. But if you consider the, the nine equations together, you observe that it's impossible to assign predefined values plus one or minus one. Very good. This is a nice example of a bipartite uh, GZ set, or as David Merriman call it, all versus nothing, no locality. But again, problem number three is, which is the simplest bipartite quantum correlations that allows for GZ set, no locality. Again, as, as far as I know, this is an open one. I mean, an open problem in the field. The final, the fourth final. Uh -huh. Can I have a question? Can I have yep. a question here? So is yep. it like this? Uh, this uh, well, the, what you show with the with the GAZ state and the measurements, no, with in this three four three four scenario. So is is it the correlation that gives rise to those correlations for which the local fraction is zero? Yes. Is it the same? It's exactly yes. the same thing. It is exactly the same, and is well known in the in the business by being the the correlation that provides the optimal mm -hmm. solution to the uh, uh, magic square game. Okay. 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 It okay. Is, is this the same thing? Okay. Everything is the same. And then you can prove okay. that there are no no signaling uh, correlations that would like outperform this. Okay. This is clear. Yeah, because it, it follows from this argument. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Exactly. That's part of the yeah. the points of of, of the, the interest of these correlations. They are not such a thing because. By by mm -hmm. definition, there cannot be. Mm -hmm. And okay, is, this is, is this the is this the minimal scenario in which you have this uh, local fraction zero? This is the question. This is what okay, is okay. not known in the field. Okay. This is the reason why you are here because hopefully I will give you the answer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And well, anticipating. Uh, uh, okay, connecting with what I said, there's a fourth perspective of the whole thing, uh, which is uh, non-local games. Uh, a non-local game is, well, you know what it is, but it's basically uh, uh, a Bell inequality scenario in which you have a particular distribution of inputs. Uh, uh, the game is characterized by a, by a winning condition and therefore given a, uh, a correlation, you do have a winning probability is an old thing. And in, well, uh, in this context, a correlation is uh, said to provide a quantum pseudo telepathy strategy if and only if the winning probability is not only larger than the classical winning probability, but actually is one meaning that the parties, in this case, Alice and Bob, wins every single run of the game. That is the reason behind the name quantum pseudo telepathy, because it is like Alice knows exactly what Bob is doing and Bob is exactly knowing what Alice is doing, right? So it is a nice name for this particular case. But again, the question is, which is the simplest bipartite quantum correlations that are also super flippant. Okay, what is the relation between these four problems? Well, 
it's very easy to see that problem one and problem two are equal, right? But the definition of local fraction and the, okay. And it is also known, also, well, there's a kind of, yeah, prove it can be, can be uh, made better that problem three and problem four are the same thing. What we did uh, in this paper I mentioned at the beginning is to prove properly that the four problems are the same problem. And this is quite interesting because depending on, because two risks, depending on where do you come from, you might be interested in one vision or the other, right? And, but mainly because now you have four perspectives on the same thing. So in principle, to attack the problem, you can use four different kinds of tools. Okay, so let me, let me, uh, give more reasons why this problem is, is interesting. One reason is related to what uh, Clemy said. I mean, is by definition, no post-quantum theory can do it better than quantum in the case of a fully non-local, all versus nothing, pseudo-telepathy correlation. So that's interesting. I mean, you cannot do it better. It's important to know when is the simplest case in which you cannot do it better by any post-quantum theory. Second reason is because there is an increasing number of protocols and not any protocol, if, if you ask me, but protocols that are kind of in the edge of interesting things to be discovered that require as a fundamental ingredient resource, uh, fully non-local bipartite, fully non-local correlations, okay? Moreover, if you ask me, the two most interesting results in recent times on, on quantum information science in general, which are the proof of the quantum computational advantage in, in solid circuits and MIP star equal RE, both use fundamentally bipartite full non-locality. And I can keep talking, talking, but actually none of these reasons is my favorite reason, so I will, I will explain what is my favorite reason. And my favorite reason is to understand the principles behind quantum correlations. To me, the best way to understand the limits of a particular quantum set, for instance, in 222, is to think about this quantum set as a shadow of a quantum set in a larger scenario that can be, or could be in this case, uh, uh, three, four, three, four. Why? Because in three, four, three, four, we know why this particular point, uh, the one that is in the right hand side, cannot be beyond. It would violate no signaling. And this has implications on the uh, bounds of the smaller set as well. Okay. But this is more kind of a general principle. I mean, in recent papers, we have found that the best or the simplest way to understand quantum correlation for a given scenario is to embed this scenario in a larger scenario in which quantum correlations touch the no signaling uh, phase. And then uh, with this perspective, trying to, to see what this, what this thing implies in the smaller and the sub scenario, let's say. So yeah, my point is this is a, really interesting problem in quantum foundation and it's quite amazing that after so long, we don't have an answer. Okay. So now let's try to understand why it's so complicated to have an answer and what is known about, what is the state of the art about this problem. Okay. And the state of the art comes from different perspectives, depending there are results proven in the context of pseudo-philopathy, there are results proven in the context of old versus nothing. But if you put them together, the perspective of the state of the art is something like this. The first question is, what is the simplest quantum system that you need to have full non-locality? And it is well known. Uh, there are many proofs in many places. I choose these two ones that you need at least a Q-treat, Q-treat. 
Okay. The second question is, okay, imagine you restrict yourself to the Q-treat Q-treat. Do we have examples of full non-locality with Q-treat Q-treats? Yes, we do. But which are the simplest one? Okay. And after uh, researching the literature, the simplest ones are like this. Alice has 16 settings with three outcomes and Bob the same, or Alice has 16 settings with three outcomes and Bob has 33 with two outcomes, or Alice has 17 settings with three outcomes and Bob has 31 settings with two outcomes. This is probably the reason why you have never seen a Q-treat, Q-treat experiment targeting full non-locality. Okay. Good. I will mention- can I, can I have a comment here? Yes. Can I have a comment here? So, so the thing is that like, uh, I think that if you take the chain bed inequality, like with any number of measurements, you can prove that the local fraction of the maximally entangled state of two qubits is zero. If you go yep. with the number of measurements to infinity. Yes, correct, so exactly. You uh -huh. can be arbitrarily close to zero, close. but never. So you you touch zero in the in the in the limit of infinitely many settings. That's yeah. correct. This is our result by yes, that's correct. That's true. Okay, but you need infinitely many to outcome settings. So yes, it's true. Okay. Uh, a good point. Uh, more things that we know. We know that with a finite number of settings, uh, uh, bipartite pseudotelepathy is impossible if one of the parties has just two settings. Okay. We also know that it is impossible if the settings are all of them dichotomic. Okay. So the first result I will I will uh, mention today is a recent result proving that actually quantum bipartite full non-locality is impossible in 3332 and 3342. Okay. The first uh, result actually solves a question that uh, was uh, presented by Nicolai Gisson and colleagues long ago because they noticed that 3332 is the first scenario satisfying a kind of minimal requirements because they filter using previous results. And well, the interesting thing is that now we can prove uh, that is not the case. That, okay. And why? And this is connected to the, I would say, most interesting result is, is this the, the equivalence between the four things, right? Uh, being in a phase of the nothing allen polytope does not contain local points, being fully non local, being all versus nothing, being pseudo telepathy, right? Because now you can, another conjecture in the, in the same paper I mentioned before by Jason and colleagues is that. Uh, they observe that existing examples of full non-locality corresponds to a maximum quantum violation of a, a tight Bell inequality. So one thing you can try for 3332 three, three, is to compute, now we can compute all facets of the local polytope and then use NPA to put bounds on the violation and then check whether we do have candidates for being fully non local. This is what we did first, and we proved that no, there are no candidates. Can I have a question here? Yes, sure. So, why, why you have to impose that, uh, that the very in, in theorem two, why you have to impose that the very inequality is tight? So, I because, mean, like, yeah, can because, you have to, okay, mm -hmm. okay, the idea is that we can. Uh, go exhaustively through the facets. No, because okay. I understand, but can you have a pseudo telepathy game uh, with a very inequality which is not tight? That is the question. Okay, that's theorem three. The answer is okay. yes. But actually, 
is another problem in the same paper. They first conjecture that the answer is no, but no. then they notice that actually they didn't have a proof. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we did in theorem two is to put this restriction of being tied mm -hmm. and check that then no. But then in addition to that, but I, I didn't include the, the detail here, but it's in the in the reference there. Uh, we found that the second conjecture of, of Gisena and colleagues is also is also not true because there are non-local games, uh, bipartite non-local games having PT strategies uh, that do not define, that they are, they are not maximally violating tight bell inequalities. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So this is actually a good intuition because they're actually, if you ask me, there are, I mean, the examples we put is particularly uh, natural, I would say, it's not really intricate. We have plenty of examples, but we choose one that is kind of obvious thing to try and you can prove that it's actually not maximally violating a, a phase. So then we have a problem because then theorem one is not that useful. So you need you need to to look another way to deal with the problem. And then is when you notice when the equivalence is, is really helpful because you jump into all versus nothing. You say, okay, whatever it is has to be equivalent to all versus nothing. And then uh, we did the following thing. First, let me let me rephrase what an all versus nothing proof is. Uh, for that, I need a definition of uh, a non-local table of zeros for a given bipartite symmetric value scenario. It's a table with has x times a uh, rows and y times v columns, in which you put a zero if and only if the corresponding uh, joint probability for that correlation, for a given correlation, is zero. And if it's not zero, you don't care. You will leave that entry empty, right? That's an interesting thing. I mean, uh, it is easy to see that what we call G at Z or all this is nothing, is nothing but a quantum correlation that produces a non-local table of zeros. That's it. And let me just put some examples to, to make the point. Okay, imagine the maximum quantum violation of close or horse human hold. Let's construct, I mean, imagine that the, the correlation corresponded to that. Okay, and let's construct this table of zeros. How many zeros do you have? Answer, you don't have zeros at all. Okay, all the probabilities that are interesting are non-zero. Okay, and notice that since this is the case, that thing, you can simulate, I mean, any deterministic local model that any, any model that assigns predetermined answers to any of the measurements works, right? At this level, if you just look at the restrictions given by the table of zeros, yeah. So, but consider for instance, Hardy, non-locality. There you have three zeros in the table of, of correlations, right? And you have more things, but if you just look at the zeros, uh, you can construct deterministic local heat of our values, right? Reproducing the zeros. So this is why Hardy is not all versus nothing or GZ, it's something else. Okay, if you go to the Mermin version with three parties of GZ, then the table is not a table, actually it's a, uh, three-dimensional uh, table make of layers with uh, many zeros there. But then uh, it's easy to, to see that you cannot make a local model for the zeros, just for the zeros. Looking at the zeros, you already notice that it's impossible to get a local model, right? Which is interesting. Okay. Or if you go to do a two observer all versus nothing, that is, as, as I mentioned, is the correlation we use for the for winning the, the magic square game. You get this. Half of the entries are zeros, and it's impossible to make a deterministic local model out of that. Okay. Okay. So 
This is to explain what is a, a non-local table of zeros and how we prove the impossibility of full non-locality in 3332 and 3342, okay? Because what we did is we generate all critical non-local table of zeros. For these scenarios, critical means that you have many tables, but there's a moment in which just by the by removing one of the zero, you have a deterministic local model, right? So, uh, and if you add more zeros, of course, there's still a, a, a non-local table of zeros, but uh, then there are too many of them. But if you just focus in the critical and with some work, you can be sure that you have generated all of them, all of them that potentially are. And then the question is, whether some of them uh, has a quantum realization. And the answer is no. Okay, so this is essentially the way we prove that full non-locality cannot exist in 3332, 3342. And then everybody or somebody in the planet start calling, should we try 3333 this way? Or should we try brute force 3333? We also tried brute force 3333, namely we have Cillions of facets, we tried maximum violations, we tried that, we failed, but we couldn't prove that 3333 three, three, three is impossible because we, I mean, we cannot be exhaustive there. So this is the end of, of the first paper. Okay, so in, um, the main point of the first paper is noticing that these four perspectives are actually the same thing, which imply super interesting connections between foundations of quantum mechanics and foundations of computational advantage and foundations of non-local games, right? And this is also useful to advance, to have some progress in this whole, uh, in this whole and fundamental problem of what is the simplest example in quantum mechanics, okay? But sadly, the conclusion of that paper is that the existing tools, even if you combine the four things and you have supercomputers and, and, and all your, the best people in, in, in the business working for this, we cannot use all these tools to solve their problems. And actually there are two problems. One is, what is the simplest form of bipartite without putting any restriction? But another interesting problem is what is the simplest form of cutrid cutrid for non locality? Because cutrid cutrid is the simplest case in which this can happen. Okay. So now we start with the second part of the of the story, and the second part of the story starts probably in 1978 when Alan Sturz writes his PhD thesis and make a very interesting observation. Namely, that you can use a uh, uh, cutie maximally entangled state between Alice and Bob. And then if Alice is measuring observables of a coaching spec set, and Bob is measuring observables of a coaching spec set, they obtain a proof of Bell theorem of a different flavor, right? So this is essentially in, in this 1978 thesis, nobody cited. Uh, but then in 1983, Esther's sort of write uh, this idea down in, 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 in a journal. And at the same time, Haywood and, and Redhead also, also wrote a, essentially the same idea in Foundation of Physics. And then Simon Cochin uh, remembered that he got the same idea and wrote a letter to Adler Simony. It's not clear exactly when Simony uh, uh, acknowledged that, but uh, they couldn't find the, the letter, whatever. But it's this idea. And this idea in the modern language is that, okay, this is a way distributing two coaches spec set between parties that serve maximal entangled state is a way to produce what in modern days we call uh, old versus nothing non-locality. Fine, but this is a way to do that, okay? Uh, there are 
some works that have refined this the connection between uh, Coach and Specker and, and, and this kind of proofs, but always, always, always on the assumption that the initial state is a maximal entangled state. And yeah, given some necessary conditions in, in that in that uh, in that framework. Okay. So the next result I think is really very interesting. Is what I call the the well, it's too too long to read it, but it's basically saying that these three things are actually equivalent to a fourth thing that is connected to the coaches Pecos. This is a particular, I mean, a necessary and sufficient condition to have any of these three things is to have a particular kind of coaches Pecker theorem, what I call bipartite coaches Pecker set. Okay, so for that. I need to a definition of what is a coaching specker set. Originally, a coaching specker set is a, a set of rank one projectors in a Hilbert space of dimension d uh, larger or equal three, which does not admit an assignment uh, between the elements of the set and zero and one, satisfying that two mutually orthogonal projectors cannot both be assigned one. And that for every set of mutually orthogonal projectors summing up to the identity, one and only of them must be assigned one. The rest must be assigned zero. Okay. If you remove the restriction of being rank one, then you have the notion of generalized coaching specker set. Good. So, and let's introduce the bipartite coaching specker set. Okay, consider a bipartite Bell scenario and consider a quantum realization in a Hilbert space. Okay, now suppose that this realization is, uh, is made through a set of projective measurements in Alice side. Therefore, you have the corresponding uh, uh, PVMs and projective measurements in Bob's side. That is something that you can always do, okay? Then a bipartite coaching specker set is a set of rank one projectors, okay? Uh, made of two parties. So one subset is given to Alice, the other subset is given to Bob, okay? And, uh, But the important thing is that this uh, uh, rank one projectors live in the full field space, H A times H B, okay? And does not admit an assignment as before, satisfying that two mutually orthogonal projectors, but now one belonging to Alice and the other belonging to Bob, cannot be both assigned one. And on the other hand, for every X, for every uh, measurement of, of Alice, the sum of the corresponding projectors, the sum of the assignment to the corresponding projectors must be one and the same for both. Okay, so this is the definition. Okay. Good. Then the interesting result is the following. A correlation, a bipartite correlation, allows for full non-locality, all versus nothing, and pseudo telepathy, if and only if the set in which S A is a set of rank one projectors into Alice post measurement states, defined by equation one, I will enter into that N. SB is the corresponding set for Bob defined by equation two is a bipartite coaches pecker set. The idea of the proof is the following. Any bipartite quantum correlation can always be achieved by a pure state and projective measurements in Alice and Bob size. Okay. So imagine that you give me a bipartite quantum correlation. And the first thing is to 
obtain this initial pure state and this corresponding measurements that uh, realize this correlation, okay? Now, imagine that these projected measurements can be implemented ideally, meaning that imagine that the measurements uh, uh, satisfy Luther's rule. So if Ali supply one of these measurements, then the corresponding post measurement state is given by Luther's rule, which is exactly what is in equation one. So equation one is Luther's transformation of uh, uh, the initial entangled state under the assumption that Alice is performing a measurement reading the outcome and he is not aware of whether or not Bob has performed a measurement. While equation two is the same, but from the perspective of Bob. Okay. So, but this is the, the thing. A necessary and sufficient condition for getting this is to have this thing. Okay. Why is this useful? To, to see how to make it useful, I need a definition, which is this local view of a bipartite Cauchy Specker set. Okay, you have imagined you have one of this, and then uh, you define the local view, Alice's local view of this set, just by tracing out Bob's part. Bob's part of Alice set defines S I prime and uh, sorry, tracing both part of Alice set defines S I prime and tracing out both part of Bob set defines S I prime prime. Okay, this is a, just a definition. Is but now these objects live in. Uh, the Hilbert space of one of the parties, not in the product Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, but now imagine that uh, the correlations is produced by measurement that project an initial entangled state into pure states, right? Just this assumption. Then, then the corresponding local view of any uh, bipartite coaches per cassette is made of projectors itself, right? Actually, is made of, it is a particular kind of generalized coaches per cassette. To be, to be brief, it's a generalized coaches per cassette with a, an extra constraint, namely that, uh, you can decide that is a generalized coaching spec set just looking at the uh, orthogonalities between one element of Alice and one element of Bob. You don't need to check orthogonalities inside Alice elements or inside Bob's elements. That's it. Okay. Alan, can I have a question here? Because I'm not yeah, sure, sure whether I I follow everything. So uh, to construct the sets like S prime of projections that are not of rank one. So you said that you trace, for instance, for Aris, you have to trace out the Bob yeah. from those states, but okay, then you will get some mixed state. And what do you do with, I mean, how do you construct this? You, in projection? principle, you may have mixed states, but mm -hmm. if, the, if the initial state, uh, I mean, and the measurements transform into, into product state, then you get a projector. That's why then you have, uh, this, this extra thing saying with measurements that project initial tangle state into product states. Then you but have you start... a projector. And, and so in general, that if I pro... oh, okay. it's, not, it's not a round one projector, it's, but it's a projector under this assumption. Yeah, but if, so if you start from rank one projections on uh, Alice and Bob sides, you project the, the entangled state, you will get a, like a pure state, which is product, and then if you trace as well. subspace, you will get like rank one projection again. Exactly. Yes. True. So, in which situations you will have non uh, rank one projections of higher ranks? When you start with an entangled state, the measurements transform into uh, a, a product state, but uh, Alice is measuring the generate. Uh, 
uh, observables rather than maximal observables. If yeah, and okay, getting cool, but... and and getting and getting the outcome corresponding to the generate subspace. Yeah, but then, I think you. But I, for I instance, think you... uh -huh. for instance, uh, there's a classical example in which you give a cauchy specker set to Alice in the sense that you give the basis of the cauchy specker set to Alice, while uh -huh. Bob is only receiving the projectors. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if now you are looking at Bob and you do this thing, and they are, they are uh, in in the experiment, whenever Bob measures a projector and gives the outcome zero, doesn't project, then the corresponding uh, local uh, view of the bipartite coach specker set that okay is could you can make it to be a bipartite coach specker set is going to be rank two, not okay. rank one. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is actually uh, there's a family of 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 uh, ways of produce of using Koch and Specker set well known since as far as I remember 1992 is the first example in which instead of doing what originally as uh, Allen Sturz and Haywood and Rethard proposed, which is giving uh, basis and basis, you give basis and projectors. Uh, there was LB and Jones 1992. Then you also get a similar contradiction. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and 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 this this particular thing covers what you what you're asking. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But it's a very interesting question. Thank you for the question because indeed helps me in the in the next thing. Now imagine, imagine, you want to uh, use it, use this to to decide whether or not there's full non locality in the three 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 Bell scenario. The answer is no, and it's easy to prove if you focus on, if you just assume that the measurements are uh, uh, maximal, meaning represented by non-degenerate uh, 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 PBMs, then the local view has to be a generalized scotch and Specker set, let's say, okay? Uh, the, the local view of a bipartite. Being a bipartite is a necessary and sufficient bipartite coaches per cassette is a necessary and sufficient condition. In this particular case, uh, the local uh, the local view that in general is is a, is a generalized coach inspector set happens to be exactly a coach inspector set with rank one projectors, I mean, right? So to make it happen, you would need a number. I mean, a coach specker set with a given number of, of rank one projectors that is easy to check. That is, well, three times three plus three times three, 18. Okay, however, it has been proven, we, we knew it is uh, long ago, but it has been recently proven that in dimension three, in dimension three, the smallest coach specker set must have at least 24 rank one projectors. In fact, the smallest known Koch Specker set has 31 rank one projectors and was discovered by Conway and Cochin. Right? So we are very far away. And, and this is so this is really exhaustive. So you can claim now that you cannot have full non-locality in 333, at least under the assumption that the observables are, are maximal. Okay. That's one interesting consequence of this uh, uh, new equivalence. I mean, this view through bipartite coach and specker sets. But there is a more thing. This is kind of more personal, but it's actually uh, an intuition that uh, several of us have been having for years. And it's the following. You know that uh, coach and specker sets are not necessary for proving a state independent contextuality. You can prove using, for instance, the, the set by U and O, right? So in this, in this uh, respect, this more uh, general version of state independent contextuality set has replaced the old fashioned Koch and Specker set for what uh, physically matters because uh, six sets are the simpler. Actually, you can prove that the simplest six set 
of rank one projectors in quantum mechanics is exactly U O. Okay. But then the question is, okay, imagine that you use this two all kind, six sets that are not Koch and Specker sets, and you distribute them between Alice and Bob, or you give them one copy to Alice and one copy to Bob. I mean, this is kind of relevant because some recent experiments are doing exactly this, okay? And some recent uh, theoretical proposals have been doing exactly this. The intuition is that presumably you will get, you may get full non-locality this way in a very compact way, right? However, another consequence of this equivalence is that you can prove this to be impossible, okay? Uh, you need a Cauchy Specker set. You need to reduce the local view of the bipartite uh, to be a Cauchy Specker set. It's not enough to be U O. U O is not Cauchy Specker set. You can call it. You just you lose at the zeros of U O. You can call it in a Cauchy Specker way. So therefore, the same happens when you distribute, no matter how you do it. That's the whole thing. And that's another interesting problem that. People have been working for a long time, and people is working is whether you can get full locality with non entangled, non maximal entangled states. Sorry, non maximal entangled states. Okay. So far, we don't have the, the answer, but the, the flavor of theorem one tells you that no, probably you can. You can. There's no real reason for, for that. That's if you ask me the virtue of theorem one, it removes the initial state. It makes the statement a necessary and sufficient statement about bipartite full non-locality without the need of assuming a particular kind of entangled states. Good. But now the most interesting thing. Now we are in the position of trying to answer problem one. What is the simplest form of bipartite for non locality? And one possible attack is the following. Consider all Koch and Specker and generalized Koch and Specker sets up to a very high dimensional, I mean, a very high cardinality. And out of each of them, for each of them, think how to distribute it between Alice and Bob to generate all possible bipartite Koch and Specker sets. This can be done in many ways, in particular in the old fashioned way, giving everything to Alice and everything to Bob. But in general, this is suboptimal. You do it with all Koch and Specker sets, assuming that you do have an exhaustive list of Koch and Specker and generalized Koch and Specker sets. And then out of that, you select the one corresponding to the mm, uh, mm, 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 minimum full non locality. Okay, of course, we don't have such a, such a list, but what we do is, we do have is about a hundred papers exploring uh, minimum uh, Koch and Specker sets and generalized Koch and Specker sets. Okay, I just took my favorite ones and did the exercise. And, and well, the answer is this one. This is the graph orthogonality of the local view of the bipartite Koch and Specker set leading to the bipartite full non locality of minimum input output cardinality using this method. Okay. Uh, okay, here. Uh, dots represent uh, rank one projectors. And, and on the corresponding vector that you have in the slide, if dots are in the same line, they are mutually orthogonal. Also, clicks are sets of mutually orthogonal. Okay, what you have here is the Koch and Specker set in dimension four proposed by Asser Perez in 1991, but distributed in a particular way. Okay distributed to give half of it to Alice and half of it to Bob. Notice that there are no orthogonalities between 
at the red dots except those that define each observable. Okay? So this is really the best thing you can do with any given Cochin Specker set. Find uh, a bipartition so Alice is not talking to Alice and Bob is not talking to Bob. Right? So basically, what you have here is that Alice has three measurements with four outcomes, and Bob has three measurements with four outcomes because the clicks are of size four. So we're talking about three, four, three, four. Moreover, okay, this is the table of zeros. You check everything, and and you can rephrase this in terms of bases this way, no matter how you rephrase it. But this is the well-known two observable, all versus nothing, or quantum solution to the magic square game. Okay. It is not a full proof. It is just a conjecture that is actually the simplest one in quantum mechanics. What is missing is that it's not well, a proof. Can I have because... a question? To... Can I yes, have a question sure. to the previous slide? Uh, so th these vectors, these are the eigen eigenvectors of the observables. Yes. So the first one is, for instance, the z z one, or well, the generalization of of the z observable, or something like this. No, I mean the sigma z. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That. Is there any? If you take the the tensor products of these vectors, like of Alice and Bob, like and list them all, do they have some? I mean, these vectors, these product vectors, will they have some interesting properties or something? Well, uh, they have this interesting property. These are the, the relations. And actually okay. what I was saying, this is exactly, okay, I can go many slides, but it's exactly what I presented before, the two observable things. So you can rephrase in terms of Pauli observables of one qubit subspace of Alice and, and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. Okay, okay. So we're talking about the same thing, okay? I'm saying mm -hmm. okay. this. Thank you. The, the only interesting thing is that, well, we didn't find anything better uh, using all this coaching spec set, except what we already knew it. Okay. That this example in 3434 three, four. It's the same example in 3434. Four, three, four. The magic square correlation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Important. This is not a proof. Okay. We didn't test all generalized coaching specker sets. We just test all generalized coaching specker sets with less than 39 elements that I'm aware of. Okay. We can do it better by testing more and or we can try to be exhaustive and and yeah. This is the, the thing. So in that sense, it's nice because this is actually Exactly, this is the collations used in these famous papers I mentioned. This is the collations everybody is, is using. And by the way, nobody is, is, is citing the first paper or the second paper in which these collations were introduced in, in 2001, okay? But, but, well, whatever it is, these are the collations, okay? It's, it's not to prove, but it's close to be a proof. Okay, good. So let's go to, let's move to problem B. What is the simplest form of Q-trip, Q-trip non-locality? Well, again, the theorem one uh, offers you a way to attack the thing. So consider all coaching specker set and generalized coaching specker set in dimension three. Okay, and then do for each of them, all construct the all possible bipartite coaching spec set. And once you have them all, identify the one corresponding to the bipartite scenario, Bell scenario with minimal input cardinality. Okay. Here is even more funny because, of course, we don't know all coaching spec sets in dimension three. It's even funnier. After a lot of time, we still don't have. Uh, the proof that which is the simplest coaching specker set in dimension three. This is an open problem in the field. 
if there is something between 24 and 31, automatically, because of this result, would be super interesting because would be a, a, a candidate to, to make what I'm about to present even more interesting. What I'm about to present is what is obtained taking all well-known coaches packet sets in dimension three and doing the same. And the answer is, again, the 33 uh, coaches packet set introduced by Asset Paris in 1991. Okay. Uh, the story of this set is, is, is really fascinating. Uh, because uh, after this thing, uh, Roger Penrose came with another 33, which has exactly the same graph of orthogonality. It was, uh, you can prove that yes, they are different. And actually then it was shown that there is a family, a whole family uh, with the same graph of orthogonality of, of different sets. And actually uh, Inger Malbenkson prove that you can parameterize the whole family with a single parameter. So here I put as an example, the original set found by Asset Paris, but you can in principle plug this, I mean, any element of this, of this family. Another interesting observation here is that this is uh, convoluted, but uh, the observables here are either triangles and you have blue triangles for uh, Bob's observables or circumferences. And then you have red triangles and red circumferences for Bob, right? So, okay, so simplify things. Uh, what is interesting is, well, uh, in this case, uh, some projector might be both in Alice and Bob's side. This is the optimal way of of, of doing it. it has to be you cannot do it better better than this but if you count the number of of triangles you would notice that there are seven and if you count the number of triangles uh, red triangles uh, you have six plus three circumferences make nine what I'm trying to say is that the simplest Q-treat, Q-treat, full non-locality, all versus nothing, or pseudo telepathy is probably this one. You prepare a maximal entangled state, and then Alice has to measure this particular nine bases, and Bob has to measure this particular seven, which compared to the examples I mentioned, the floor with 17, 33, 31 is, is kind of an improvement to the point that this is experimentally testable. I guess there's no fundamental problem in targeting this particular uh, correlation and experimentally measuring uh, what matters here. Notice that the game here is not checking a violation of a bell inequality. Actually, the game is checking how close you are to the face of the no signal in polyto. That is what is interesting about this, this experiment. And yeah, same uh, caution as before. This is not to prove. We didn't test all generalized uh, coaches packets in dimension three, just the famous ones. So, but I promised to talk about something else. Now I convince, I expect that I've convinced you that coaches packet sets are really much more important than we thought. They are in one-to-one -one or a particular kind of coaching spec set is in one-to-one -one correspondence to bipartite collations that are touching the no signal in polytope. And so kind of besides this, uh, another interesting question is what are coach and specker sets or in general state independent contextuality sets useful for, okay? So 
I promise to talk about something else. I will quickly summarize this something else because it's really, again, super interesting. But I, I yeah, I don't have time to, to really uh, go to the details. So the first point is that uh, some of these success are unique up to an isometry and have a witness, a contextuality witness that has for any initial state, the same value, okay? And combining these two properties, you can certify in an ideal experiment, just looking at the statistics, uh, any of the sets, okay? Under the only assumption that the initial state, okay, I'm talking about sequential measurement experiments. You have a, an initial state, uh, 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 sharp implementation of one of these uh, measurements of the six set, followed by another implementation of of, of this uh, measurements. Right? Let's assume initially that these measurements are perfect. Okay, we initially we are in the ideal case, and uh, just looking at the uh, output the statistics under the assumption that the boxes are, are independent and there's no uh, the system has no memory and so on. And the assumption that the initial state is uh, is a full rank. Uh, this isometry, uniqueness up to isometry and so on, allows you to certify some of the success. That's the point, not all, some of them, okay? This is what we call full rank state independent certification. We prove that sets with these properties exist in any finite dimension starting with three. We prove that so far we assumed everything is perfect, but we can have imperfections. And we prove that at least in dimension three and four, this uh, certification is robust. And then we've also proved something which is quite intriguing that uh, uh, coaches spec set that are complete, like Verse twenty four, in which uh, all the all the um, elements belongs to uh, a complete uh, uh, basis, can be belts of tested if and only if they can be uh, uh, certified in this using this this method. So I won't go to, to the details. First, we define a a witness for rank one, then. We define the kind of isometries and then the main result. And just mentioning that the first or the simplest six set in dimension three that allows for full rank certification uh, without any extra assumption is uh, is this one proposed in, in 2012. It is not UO. UO allows for full rank certification under an extra assumption, namely that the sum of the probabilities of what is supposedly to be a basis has to be one. You don't need this assumption here. Uh, the simplest coach spec set in dimension four with the same property is the, the 18th. Uh, basically, we prove that, yeah, this 21, 18, uh, this 18, uh, induces pairs 24 are allowed for this, you all allow for this under an extra assumption. And then we also measure, the, let's say, the robustness of, of each of them. And well, we have um, a lot of um, open problems just to, I mean, that's the final slide is. Uh, I have the suspicion that any set of quantum observables can be extended to a rigid six set. That would be super nice because it would mean that at least ideally you can use this technique to, to certify them. Then the most interesting thing is, and we think we have it, that so far mm, device independent certification focus on when we talk about measurements, we actually talk about quantum effects. But the question is, can we self-test or in a test in a device-independent way quantum instruments? And the combination of the standard belt self-testing and full rank uh, suggests that the answer is yes. 
And then uh, very old questions that now turned out to be super important. What is the cochins pego set in dimension three with the smallest number of elements or with the smallest number of, of bases? So thank you for your invitation. Thank you for your attention, for your questions. These are the, the three references in which this talk has been based on. And questions. Well, thank you very much, Adam, for accepting our invitation and give this very nice talk. Uh, we pass a, a little bit of the time, but I think it's worth it. Sure. Now, now we can open for, for quick questions from our audience. Okay, so I have asked many questions already, but like would have another one concerning this uh, full rank certification. So you, you you said that you don't uh, you don't make any other assumption except for this full rank thing. But uh, so how do you certify that your measurement is projective or something? No, no. Uh, in the in the initial uh, statement, uh, we assume that it's projective. Ah, okay. okay so. there, there are two cases. The, uh, okay. what the, the ideal scenario, which we assume that the measurements are projective, and then what, what we call robustness is we take how we uh, um, uh, relax this assumption, in a sense. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, I see. So this is, uh, and then uh, we quantify the relaxation through a parameter, and then we compare robustness between different uh, uh, full rank certification based on different six sets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, maybe I would have another question. So, like, so if you have this uh, full non-locality thing, no, I mean, you have correlations that that are fully non-local, so they don't have any local part. Uh, for instance, in the multi-party scenario, I mean, so what can you construct now from from them, from these correlations? So you can construct all versus nothing proofs, and uh, I don't know some interesting but inequalities. Okay, the first thing is that uh, uh, the the equivalence can be generalized to multipartite the scenarios. Uh, mm -hmm. Then tables become uh, become matrices uh, in the dimension, and then uh, bipartite Cauchy Specker sets become n-partite Cauchy Specker sets. It's, it's not even in the in the paper uh, I am about to submit, but can be done and probably should be done. Uh, basically, the answer to your question is. It is uh, a recipe to produce new forms of full non-locality that mm -hmm. are not under the radar of the standard methods. For instance, already in the bipartite, it's a method to produce examples of full non-locality not based on maximally entangled states. Okay. But, but you don't have an example of that, no? No, I don't have. Mm -hmm. I don't have. Uh, <laughs> I may know someone who has it, but I don't have. <laughs> and who has it? I may know. I prefer not to answer that. Okay. I mean, there are people that I mean. There are people that I put a name of a person that that was interested in this problem long ago, uh, and other people are interested in in this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, would I? We do have, for instance, we do have very compact uh, coach and specker sets in high dimensions, okay? And this equivalence allows you to immediately uh, produce relatively compact, actually very compact examples of full non-locality in high dimensional systems, which, may have interest by itself. So, but basically, I mean, the broad answer is, this is super interesting, but depends on what you want. Uh, depends on things you want to prove or to or to produce, but uh, yeah, a method well, to- Well, I was just asking, I mean- I was No, no, just asking. And, and it's, because what I'm trying to say is that in this particular answer, I'm super biased because I have my own obsessions. And 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 now they have the um, high dimensional entanglement. Uh, it would be super nice. I mean, everybody, for instance, now everybody's parallelizing the standard uh, uh, Paris Mermin magic square 
whatever, 2001 mm -hmm. correlation, okay? Uh, uh, but another question is, and, and this is a kind of standard paradigm, right? What I'm trying to say is that with existing touches, because said I can do it much, much better than that in a sense of compactness, right? And get interesting results out of that. I mean, I can get uh, examples of this or in, give me a dimension, I know dimension, uh, even dimension, local dimension, and I produce one of this, much more compact than the equivalents. You might get parallelizing the standard one, right? So this introduced a new tool, uh, a new target for experimentalists in, in, and is there mm -hmm. waiting? Okay, so maybe the last question. So do you know examples of mixed states uh, with like full non-locality? Uh, no, I don't, but I bet there are. Okay, yeah, there are, there are. Yeah. Is. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I have and, a question, if I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the first and second result would be like complete if you looked at all the cautious packer sets, right? Yes. Uh, but have they on, all be characterized like the mathematically? Do we know uh, all of them or? No, we don't. Uh, okay. Uh, Mladen Pavisic has been working on that uh, alone for, well, not alone with many other people around, but uh, for years, at least uh, in round one. And and he has a long collection, but uh, uh, in an exhaustive way, we cannot go beyond, and this is a result by Semping Su, Otfried Gune, and, and colleagues, beyond 18. Okay. okay, and notice that the uh, so it basically says that there's no one with just one coach spec said with 18 lives in dimension four and that's it. So the game starts in 18 basically, and starting there, we don't have any exhaustive characterization of the coach spec sets okay. because there are too many cases that we can consider. Okay, so in a sense. Uh, even if you've tried every known cautious specker set, there could be an no unknown which would give you a better advantage. Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Okay, I think we should finish for today. Once again, thank you, Adam. And thank you, thank you everybody for coming. See you next time.